Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 363, I chat with video technologists Joel Silver, Matt Murray, and Mark Henninger about the 2017 TV shootout. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded July 20th, 2017. Episode 363 2017 TV Shootout. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and editor of AVSForum.com. This week, I've got a full panel of guest geeks. First up is Joel Silver, founder and president of the Imaging Science Foundation. Hey, Joel, welcome back. Hey, great to be here. And nice to great be in to town, to not be... traveling for a week. <laughs> for only a week. I know, you travel a lot. Yeah, I'll uh, go to Austin, next, Texas, up... next week. Okay, well, then I'm glad we caught you at home. Uh, next up, Matt Murray, CTO of uh, AV Pro. Uh, Matt, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, you're even on vacation and you're coming on the show. That's that's uh, above and beyond. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, no problem. Anytime. Okay. And finally, uh, Mark Henninger, uh, Associate Editor of AVS Forum, my partner in crime. Hey, Mark, welcome back. Oh, thank you, Scott. Pleasure to be here. So I want to make sure everybody knows before we start that uh, those of you who are watching live at live.twit.tv can join the chat room there or go to irc.twit.tv, and you can post questions as we go, and I'll pass along as many as I can. So, we're here today to talk about the 2017 flat panel shootout, which occurred last week at uh, the event in New York called CE Week. And uh, this has been going on for many, many years, and uh, it, it had a little bit of a change of format this year, uh, which we will get into. Uh, but first, um, Joel, tell us who were the entrants? Which TVs were actually under discussion this year? Well, this year was an interesting year. We had an LG OLED, one of their top of the lines. We had the Sony OLED. We also had the Sony Z9D, their top line local area dimming LED TV. Right next to it, we had the absolute pleasure of having a Sony BVM, that's the B as in boy, broadcast video monitor, the 30-inch professional set, which everyone absolutely fell in love with. Uh, for about $30,000 for a 1,000-inch, we were happy with that one. <laughs> for had, a 30-inch, uh, you mean? <laughs> well, for 30-inch. Uh, broadcast things are usually a 1,000-inch, the... Uh, Forty-seven yeah. Dolby, forty-seven thousand dollars. They're easy to price. Uh, we yeah, had yeah. the Samsung QLED there. Their new technology, and that one actually came with AutoCal, and we'll talk about that later. That was very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. New Vizio model, and one that came in through CE Week from Westinghouse. So we had an interesting roundup of technologies, price points, and the calibration. We had the pleasure of. Having Mr. Tyler Pruitt come in from SpectraCal from Washington, D.C., yeah. Washington State, and he did an amazing job. We'll talk more about that later as well. And yep. we have to give a little thanks to Robert Zahn, who sired this 14 years ago. And uh, he's permitted us to take over administration of uh, the shootout he sired and make some changes year by year. And I think this was the most interesting, yeah. So we'll be able to talk more about that as we proceed today. Yep, indeed. Uh, also, the judging was a little different this year. Matt, you were one of uh, uh, how many? Six judges or so? It was not audience judged as it had been in the past. Correct. Yes, I was. Uh, I, I became one of the judges um, as a uh, stand in for Sam Runco. He wasn't able to make it. Um, so, yeah, there was uh, actually five judges in total this year. Um, everybody oh, five who judges. was okay. a judge was from the industry. Yep. Right. And that was the, I think the important point to make here that, um, in the years past, anybody who came to the shootout could vote on various categories of, of performance and so on. And that's how the winner was determined. But, uh, in this, this year it was decided to just let, I mean, people could come and view uh, the, the process and everything, but, 
uh, there were there were these professional judges, people with who work in the industry and are able to evaluate picture quality from a professional point of view. Um, Mark, you were right. you were there just as an observer, uh, so you weren't one of the judges, but uh, you you were able to be there and see things uh, progress. Uh, what did you think of the of that particular change this year? Uh, in terms of not having audience vote, I would have yeah. preferred to have both. And uh, but let's say just have it be that the pros pick the winner because in years past it was uh, they did have a pro, pro vote until last year, uh, but the difference was that the audience vote actually selected the the the, the singular winner. So now we mm. this year, which is something else that should be discussed, they had three different categories that could be won. Uh, but they use the pro votes. Anyway, I think it's fun for the audience to vote, and I think it's fun to know what the attendees collectively thought and to compare that to the pros. But I think it's a good decision to let people who work with content and content mastering and work with the uh, professional broadcast monitors, you know, actually make that evaluation, uh, you know, especially under the tight parameters of calibrated TVs versus calibrated mastering monitor. It, it makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Joel, uh, Mark just mentioned that uh, there were three categories this year, not just a single winner, as there had been in almost, I think, every other running of the Bulls, so to speak. <laughs> um, what were the three categories, and why was it, uh, why was it sp uh, split out that way? Well, interesting. The feedback we got from manufacturers was most interesting, and it influenced every change we made. Uh, one of the things that manufacturers were feeding back about was the... Uh, Perhaps uh, favoritism or lack of objectivity or owner loyalty from end users who would tend to vote on what they bought. And we could certainly understand that. And for objectivity, one of the things I suggested you know, right off the bat was just bring in reviewers. Because, you know, I broke into this business with AV magazines and are friends with many reviewers. And that was a mixed reception from manufacturers, uh, as you might expect. Mm. When uh, we suggested, interesting. We suggested, well, you know, most of the reviewers I know call them as they see them, like it or not like it. They, I work with some wonderful people. But, you know, reviews can be controversial. But once we were putting in a broadcast monitor in, a BVM, the people who live and breathe with BVMs and create content for us to watch became a readily accepted group of judges. And they have no bias, preference, or massive experience with consumer TV. So the feedback I got from the judges this year was it was very interesting to see just how far consumer TVs have come across the board. So mm. that was most intriguing. And last mm -hmm. year we added one category, which I think is critical. Being a videophile and a home theater enthusiast myself, um, I watch in very tightly controlled lighting. I'm very careful with the wall colors. I'm very careful with how we calibrate things, and the room is part of what we calibrate. Uh, so we're in the 3 to 5% of the market. So we created a bright room category, which was intriguing. That's how more people watch by a prop factor of 20. And two manufacturers asked us for something that's not really on my radar, and that is to take a look at how their processing impacts less than pristine signals like streaming. And we were also asked to bring in satellite and cable, which was difficult to do in our facility, so we'll work on that next year. But streaming is an intriguing category. Uh, I actually can enjoy streaming on my iPad and my phone, but when you put it on a projector, uh, the lack of bandwidth definitely creates an inferior experience, both A and V. And it's getting better, but adding that to the judging was interesting, and we were able to do something intriguing there. And i got to give major kudos to Mr. Matt Murray, who I'm really happy is here with us. Uh, he was one of the people instrumental in developing one of the two HDR, HDCP 2.2, 18-gig generators that's used by high-end calibrators and manufacturers alike. He took the test patterns from the generator, the pristine patterns, put them on YouTube, so we could see good, better, and different what's left of the test patterns when we stream them. And we use that as a point of reference to judge streaming. So on one hand, wow. we have the ideal video coming from the BVM. On the other hand, let's say the slightly less than ideal video coming from YouTube. But it was uploaded critically, carefully, and as best as possible by Matt and his team. So it was a good source of streaming. And when we looked at you know, 2K resolution test patterns, it was surprisingly decent. Um, I don't know what to say about the 4K uploads that we saw, but they were a little less than decent. <laughs> okay, Matt, let's, let's, get, let's hear a little bit more from you about that. 
Uh, I'm, I didn't. I actually hadn't heard this before that, that you actually took test patterns and uploaded them to YouTube. I mean, I've always wondered how in the heck are we going to calibrate the streaming input to a TV uh, or a cable or satellite uh, because there's no test patterns. Uh, so the fact that you did that onto YouTube in order to sort of objectively evaluate what how the TVs are performing via streaming, I, I thought that's brilliant. It's it's definitely uh, a very interesting thing to do, and it's a couple reasons behind it because we have noticed that there's kind of variances even with how you're streaming. So, for instance, like if you're using on-device streaming, um, sometimes that's not as adequate as what you would see uh, through you know a, a streaming device <laughs> that's designed and built to do it and plugged into an HDMI port. Uh, you're talking and the by, other, by on device. Uh, I'm sorry, by on device streaming. You're talking about an app within the TV, right? Correct. Yeah. So, like, if you okay. buy a a new TV and you just log into Roku or or sorry, not Roku, you log into uh, Netflix or whichever it might be directly from the TV, um, you may have different results versus you know some uh, you know maybe device that was designed to do pull in the online streaming and kind of help it out a little bit. And from a Certainly. calibration standpoint, it gets very interesting because, you know, I, I notice even on, on my equipment at home, if I can have a, a different video mode um, come into play based on which app I'm using. So it's something important that um, calibrators and installers definitely need to think about. Um, certainly consumers, because, you know, you may think you have a good calibrated display, but the second you turn on, um, you know, something streaming directly from the TV or even a source that has HDR, you're in a completely different mode and you don't even realize that it's changed. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it's a little bit better if you're using some external device so you can manage calibration from that point, I think, and this is uh, kind of an opinion of mine, you know, if you can centralize where well, your good. streaming content's coming from, you know, you can you can control how the picture looks based on an HDMI input, and you can use those patterns that you're streaming to compensate for that. So you might use a different input or something like that or a different picture mode, but it, it encompasses all the streaming stuff. <clears throat> so one thing we noticed right away is, you know, obviously resolution gets affected um, in, intensely. Uh, different frame rates affect it big time too. Uh, but the most interesting thing was black levels seemed very much elevated when you're using um, on-device streaming. So uh, that that was kind of one thing that we noticed is, you know, you almost wow. have to do a completely different picture mode. So you can't really just calibrate a TV per se and have that black level carry over to the streaming content. You know, you need a completely different, completely different setting. Now, uh, Scott, I mentioned Scott, that can I, it's Scott, consistent. Scott, can I sorry, Joel. Can I touch on something? Yeah, because Matt's hit on a key sure. point here. I want to okay. actually do the research with your audience right here. One of the things we were discussing was not only to have a streaming category, but one, should they be a streaming device category? So mm. if you could ask your audience for feedback based upon their viewing habits, how many of them have actually had a better or worse experience with devices added onto systems as opposed to on-device streaming. And Are we your audience, about ABS uh, audience? Yeah. They, they, well, yeah. actually, actually, I, I was just ask. about to say. Yeah, they're pretty Go clever ahead, Mark. folks. Yeah, no, I, I, I've run into this with TVs, and I, I absolutely agree with Matt. Uh, I, I suggest using an external device uh, explicitly so you can take advantage, full advantage of, of the TV's modes and have it be predictable. Uh, and I was just going to say that that that's that's certainly the consensus on on AVS forum where where people choose their streaming devices based on on quality and, and having the whole video chain be predictable. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so Mark, I, all can I, I do you, is can say, ask you a question, hey, Mark. Yeah. Yes. For next year, if we're going to discuss adding a fourth category for streaming device, would right. that make sense? And to have people vote whether the streaming devices in mass were better than on TV the, streaming, uh, and then vote for the best device. Yeah, that, I think that should happen. I mean, I, I've I've seen oddly 
even Dolby Vision measure massively differently when streaming through Voodoo than than off of a you know Ultra HD Blu-ray player. And with Dolby Vision, it should be, as far as I understand it, the, the same thing. But I guess because of you know the way it triggers picture modes, uh, it isn't. And uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of confusion there. If you use the internal apps, uh, there's no consistency. External device, Roku or, or Chromecast Ultra or whatever is out next year, maybe there's something new that's even more incredible. Uh, but yeah, a nice HDR capable, Dolby Vision capable, preferably if, if such a thing is is to be, you know, well, there's, whatever. Yeah, there's one now, Chromecast Ultra. There might be others okay. next year. Hey, Mark, yeah. uh, this is actually a great idea for a poll. Let's put a poll up on AVS. A forum that 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 asks, you know, have you tried the in-app? The yeah, it, it, comparing the uh, TV in-app stream streamer versus an external box, uh, you know, which is better? You know, we'll figure out exactly how to word it. But I think Joel, your point is very well taken. Uh, and that, Scott, uh, that we can do some research. I'm looking for market research to take to the shootout next year and to take to the manufacturers. They simply yeah. say, you know, mm -hmm. if we're going to learn something at the shootout, maybe we should learn that uh, improving on-device capability might be intriguing. And comparing it to device streaming, it's going to be an interesting and controversial part of the next shootout oh. if we can put this together. And, and there's yeah. one yeah. last bit of depth there, which is after a few years, I mean, let's be honest, uh, TV makers, you know, don't pay attention to older models. If you switch to an external device... You know, on a good platform, you can always be on the latest hardware and, and keep your TV for a few years. Uh, yeah, on TV. I, I absolutely, I love that you said that, Mark, because that's something I've been telling people too. Is you know, I I have a, a TV at home that just gave me a notice that said, uh, "Hey, sorry, your on-device streaming apps are no longer going to be updated." So um, that's that introduces a whole other problem itself. So from an infrastructure standpoint, I'm a hundred percent in agreement with that you know an external device is is key and critical yeah thx1138 in the chat room is saying i never use built-in tv apps they have they are abandoned way too soon if i could buy a dumb tv i would and that I've, i get that question all the time of can i even buy a dumb tv that is a tv without apps in it and there aren't very many except at the extreme extreme low end of the, of right. the price scale, but any otherwise, you know, you're going to get those apps. Uh, well, and us, as, us as geeks, you know, that, that, the, the, and I, I kind of understand that a little bit from, you know, a marketing and a, uh, you know, a TV selling perspective, you know, cause the, the geeks, us, people like us, you know, we want, you know, we care about, okay, you know, we'll pay a little more money to get a better picture, you know, scrap the apps and let us deal with the content. But, you know, I think the the core reason why it's there is a lot of this stuff sometimes I think can be, you know, uh, check boxes. You know, if my competition has it, I have to have it too kind of thing. Mm, good point. Good and point. Scott, I'd love to be able to go back to the content creation community and show them what their end users are seeing out there with various options open to them. One of the things we mm -hmm. asked for and couldn't put together this year was for someone to bring a drive with their content and stream so we could actually see direct from the drive, then degradation from a disc, then degradation from the stream. Oh, man, wouldn't and that be an interesting experiment? Nice. Well, we posed yeah. it, and I will tell you, we had a lot of people from content creation toured the room to see what was going on, and the consensus we got was if we knew what this was all about, we would have been part of it this year. So I think they recognized good things about their pictures and problems that they're seeing. And it's nice to get them involved in the consumer side of things. Now, we did have a number of people in creation that wanted to partake and weren't permitted. Um, one actually was busy making more 70 millimeter projectors for Dunkirk work, so we lost one judge there. We did lose four judges last minute, and we lost some that companies didn't permit them to do it. One prominent mm. gent who Please remain nameless, but he's one of the great experts dealing with Dolby Vision. He has a Pulsar monitor he works with daily. Uh, they have a relationship with someone in Europe that precluded him attending. So next year mm -hmm. after this publicity hits, which has been big, and now that the community understands what we're trying to do, uh, the reception from content creation in New York City was excellent. They loved the idea, and they even had compliments for almost every single set. They were surprised how well they calibrated. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, we're going to get to calibration in just a second, but uh, Matt, I wanted you to, you worked a lot on the infrastructure of, of, 
you know, the, how things were set up and connected and working together. Uh, could you give us a little bit of a of an idea of of how that was? What what was going on there? So basically, um, what we set up there was an eight by eight matrix. Um, you know, the the entire infrastructure when you're dealing with wanting to do HDR gets a little bit challenging because everything you need you need bandwidth. So you need 18 gig per second, um, basically, to be able to do it. Um, and there's you know some reasons behind that. Um, even though most of the content will play out um, somewhere in the realm of you know 11 to 14 gig per second. Um, menu screens a lot of times are, you know, 4K60, 444. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that term by now. Um, and Well, you know, you maybe really... not everybody, but it's just it basically 444 is, uh, is a designation of that, they're, that the color, the RGB, red, green, blue color, is not being uh, compressed in a particular right. way. Uh, yep. and, and it's the, it requires the most bandwidth to, to convey over HDMI. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, we used, we used a 18 gig switcher, um, a, a AV pro connect one. Um, and we also used cables provided by Metra. So those, those were, you know, carrying the signal and they were good long cables, um, HDMI, um, copper cables. One of them was a, uh, a active optical cable that, you know, we used for, um, one of the displays, but you know, all things being equal, we wanted to maximize what what was being displayed on those TVs. So, you know, we went through a little bit of a kind of background knowledge that we had just in how kind of these things work. Um, you know, I've done luckily a lot of distribution for 18 gig, and I've helped on a lot of projects. So, uh, we kind of had some some insight already. But you know, we we made the decision to. Uh, play out the Blu-rays, and basically the format was 4K24, um, 444, and it was 12-bit deep color. Uh, so that was what we were running for HDR. Uh, we tried to do 422. Um, unfortunately, that signal is not as widely accepted and creates some issues for um, you know infrastructure and displays and things like that. Um, and you know 420 was we we tried that out as well but that's that's even a less accepted signal format when you're talking you know 4k 30 4k 24 kind of film frame rate type space mm. uh, but we got it we got it all set up and well, Matt, we, um, Matt, worked, when you say accepted, are you talking image quality or no picture or both uh, well i mean it's it's uh well if you do if 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 you use 422 um that introduces a lot of uh, banding type issues and stuff into displays. Um, so we we obviously didn't want to do that. So we wanted to give as good of a signal as we can, and that's why we went with the you know the four 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 format instead. And did you have instances where settings actually created a no picture circumstance where you couldn't get sync? That happens Blank often screen. when you when you when you try to do four K thirty or twenty four. And 420 with deep color, oftentimes that's an unsupported format. I yeah, should so say, just to make sure everybody understands. TVs to work. Yeah, that was the only way to get all TVs to work, I guess, was 444. Yes. 422 and 420 are, are more compressed color uh, formats. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, 420 is how color is stored on Blu ray and Ultra HD Blu ray. But the player, once you play the disc, then expands that back out to 444 by the time it, it sends it out. I guess you have a, a setting in many players that, that you can select what goes out, right? You can. Um, it's some, some more so than others. Um, you know, the, from, from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, what, what, what we're finding oftentimes is you don't always have as much control as you think inside of a... Uh, inside of a, a source device. So oftentimes you're relying on uh, EDIDs, uh, which that's the, that's the identification information that a source relies on to say, okay, you know, I'm prepared to send HDR out of my HDMI output because you're telling me that you can handle it. And what we're seeing EDID, by the a way, lot is, is ex hang on a second, Matt. Um, EDID stands for Extended Display Identification, uh, which basically the TV 
sends back along the HDMI cable to tell the source device, say a Blu-ray player or, HD, or UHD Blu-ray player, here's what my capabilities are. Right. And we see all the time, uh, this is not exclusive to anything specifically, but the, um, the EDIT information carries so much weight in this transitional time frame that we're in right now that even if you tell a player device to behave a certain way, it will not do it because the EDID is not uh, something that it says this is safe to do. So uh, there are various reasons. One is, you know, uh, most infrastructure is not 18 gig. So um, as, as a manufacturer, they're going to make a product that displays a picture. Otherwise, it goes back to where it was purchased. Um, right. The other reason, right. right. And the, the other thing is TV manufacturers do the same thing because, you know, if, I, if I'm a source or I'm a sink, the sink being a display, um, you know, those are the two things that get returned to the retailer when no picture happens. And the TVs, so one, you know, th it's important to know, and, I, and you have an audience here, so I'd love to just mention this, when you're dealing with 4K HDR TVs and you're not getting the output that you want from your source devices, there's every single manufacturer has a setting that you can change the actual EDID inside of the TV. Um, all HDR TVs that I'm aware of and projectors have this function where you can actually change the EDID. Sometimes they'll call it enhanced. Sometimes they'll call it HDMI deep color. Sometimes it'll be called UHD deep color. Um, and really all that's doing is nothing more than um, giving the consumer or the installer a tool to use when they're confident that their cabling and their infrastructure can actually handle this high bandwidth content. Right. Scott, right. we're getting calls hey. daily from all over the world about no HDR in an HDR system. I was in a system two days ago. It was extraordinarily expensive and had a wonderful 4K picture, but no 12-bit, no HDR. We had to replace infrastructure, cable and switches to make it work. And Matt's got a whole mm. team doing tech support on exactly this issue globally. So just getting HDR is now half of the job of calibrating HDR. Well, yeah, and we, we are in such wild, wild west uh, situation in terms of HDR that uh, it's going to be that way for a while, I think. Yeah. Uh, like getting back to the question. We've never had a smooth yeah. launch in the history of consumer television. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true enough. <laughs> we make it work, true and enough. This, one's, this one's worth the work. Yeah, oh, I totally agree. And I'm sure we, I'm sure we all agree that, that HDR is definitely worth the work. Uh, because, uh, Mark, you've, you've now been watching quite a bit of HDR, um, and I'm, you must agree that it's well worth the effort, eh? Oh, completely. I mean, best uh, cinematic experiences I've had at home uh, ever. Uh, and, 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 you know, you, you say HDR, but really the complete package uh, that includes the wider gamut color, not just the extra luminance, uh, it, it comes together. And, and, you know, if you're sitting close enough to a large enough TV, then you're going to exceed a cinematic experience because you're actually going to have more contrast, more brightness, uh, and and you know playing off a disc. Uh, I got to say, you know, I mean, sure, maybe you get more bandwidth uh, in a commercial cinema, but uh, that the home experience right now is pretty profound, and it's never been pretty phenomenal. amazing. Yeah, uh, getting back for a moment to you know sort of the future of this shootout and where might we do it. Um, SoCal Ray Jr. in the chat room, our good friend Ray. Uh, says maybe it would make more sense to do this shootout at NAB where there's a bunch of professionals. I mean, that's who's there. Um, the problem that I see with that, first of all, is that NAB is in the spring. It's usually in April. Uh, and the, that, that, that year's t TV models often haven't come out yet. Uh, so that would be one problem. Another problem is that there would be no, um, well, Consumers don't normally, can't normally attend NAB, although, of course, you could hold the thing off-site, but then getting people over someplace off-site is always, always difficult. Um, how difficult was it, um, Joel, let me ask you this, how difficult was it to get these TVs? This was in uh, mid-July, and I think it was a little later than the, the shootout normally has been well, held in Definitely. the past. Which means with that the TVs, one, exception one model, we just went and bought them. I should say, CE uh, Week went and bought them, and there was yeah. one model that was back ordered completely. And for that one, we needed a manufacturer for a demo unit. 
Other than that, one was bought online, the rest were all bought locally. So it's not that hard to buy them that time of year, going a little earlier. Yes. The problem I would see with NAB, you've got some of the best judges on the planet there, and none of them are going to give up multiple hours of showtime to go help the consumer electronics industry. They're there mm. for a purpose, and their schedules are overwhelmed as it is. So I'd love mm -hmm. to do it yeah. there, but we could never get people to give up showtime to come help the consumer side. Good point. Good point. Um, let's take a look at the calibration results. Uh, Tyler Pruitt, as, as Joel, as you mentioned, did uh, some of the calibrations. I, I was talking with him, and, and he said he did some of the TVs, and Kevin Miller did some of them. Is that right? Kevin did one. Tyler did most of them. Uh, one actually didn't have enough calibration controls. We couldn't do much with it all. But uh, Tyler did most. Mm. And what was really wonderful to see was a dream from the 80s from a little old company called Philips TV Test Equipment, one of the original meter manufacturers who had a plan, a dream, that they would plug their meter into the side of their TV, stick it on the screen, press a button, and while they're packing things up, the TV would calibrate itself. So that was in you know, 1988, 89. It's been a long-term dream. Uh, Philips mm. branded products didn't survive. They closed that division. We worked on it with Pioneer. We worked on it uh, with Spectrical to begin with. And this is a large I endeavor. I think Panasonic, company. Panasonic had it for a little while as well, didn't they? Through, through Spectrical. Through Calman. Through Spectrum. And yeah, through Cal It worked nicely, yeah. and but it was not without bugs. It was not without difficulty, and there's a transition now. Spectrical is now part of portrait displays. They've got resources and organization and manufacturers contact they never had before, and we had the pleasure of having Martin Fishman, the owner of portrait displays there, talking about what he's hoping to do, and if we can take some of the drudgery out of calibration, now simple things like white balance and color management are not a high skill set to get done, but it's very repetitive and very labor intensive. Those two things on the Samsung with the brand new Calman were literally a button press, and uh, one of our top people was there, Kevin Miller. He looked at the results when we double-checked things, and then went to Tyler and said, um, how much touch-up did you need to do after the AutoCal? And Tyler shrugged his shoulders and said, touch-up? I just ran the AutoCal. So it was done. So if we can wow. free up time and get the average result to be dramatically better, uh, portrait displays is onto something here, and we've been looking for this for a very long time. So they've now got resources, and Tyler demoed it. He did a really good job, and the Samsung flatlined automatically on color management. Well, let's Grace. yeah, let's take a look at that. Actually, uh, we have the cal calibration <coughs> results from from all the TVs. Uh, let's start with the Samsung Q9. Uh, but before we do, uh, Joel. I want to make sure everybody understands what the calibration equipment was that we were using, uh, that you guys were using at the shootout. Well, fortunately, we were supported by Konica and Alta Sensing. They sent us a CS2000, about a $37,000 reference meter. We used that to program the Klein K10, so the color accuracy of the CS2000 was programmed into the Klein for every TV set, which is one of the things Calman does. So we had reference quality color equipment lined up to do a profile for every TV in the room. And I just, I'm very astonished by all the support you guys got. That's great. Well, amazing. They're looking at the consumer products a little bit differently. They're getting you know to respect our products now. They're no longer just consumer junk. They're seeing really good pictures. And remember, on the content creation side, they're buying client monitors to see what their work looks like on consumer products in every studio. So, yeah. And they've had some difficulties getting past what they used to look at, which was CRTs and plasmas. So they're jumping on to newer products. And as you've seen, the last few years have been wonderful for consumer TV. They need to replace all the client monitors with current models, which is one of the reasons we wanted them to see this year's TVs. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's take a look at the calibration results. First of all, the auto calibration of the Samsung Q9, which is their QLED, QLED TV, top of the line. These were all uh, flagship products, by the way. Uh, so if we take a look at the Samsung Q9, it's ruler flat in the in the grayscale and we go on to the to the next page gammas again ruler flat and this is in sdr moving on to the next one uh saturation sweeps those look a little off to me um 
but I'm not quite sure. You know, you can see those dots are not actually lining up with the with the squares, which are the targets that they should be at. Um, Scott, what we but, reference uh, there is a sweep from a PVM. We use that in all our trainings. And the PVM, as opposed to a broadcast video monitor, professional video monitors are $5,000 20-inch TV sets. And they don't line up quite perfectly either. So if we get to PVM performance on the consumer set, I celebrate. <laughs> okay, fine. Good. Uh, next page, uh, we will see uh, the P3 saturation sweep. Again, it's, it, it looks very good. Um, it kind of starts not being perfectly accurate out at the high saturation points, but that's to be expected. EOTF looks great. RGB balance, not perfect, but still probably well within, uh, you know, the, the limits of, of human vision anyway. Uh, I think that's probably it on the pages for... For the Samsung, so let's take a quick look at the LG uh, E7. We can see, Joel, as you mentioned, uh, the uh, RGB balance is just flat as can be. The, the little point in the lower right corner is right where it's supposed to be. Uh, as we move to the next page, uh, we can see this is the um, another look at the grayscale. And again, it looks very flat. Uh, the, uh, the EOTF electro optical transfer function looks really good, right on the money. Um, everything looks excellent. Go to the next page. I think we'll probably see color. Uh, this is the saturation sweeps, uh, in the color space known or color gamut known as P3. Uh, and that looks right on the money. It, as far as P3 goes, doesn't get out to BT 2020. BT 2020 is a larger gamut. Um, and also, a largely non-existent the... gamut right now as far as content's concerned. Yes, exactly right. We'll, we'll, we'll exactly. get there one day. It's a great mathematical goal. It's based on pointer's gamut, which goes beyond what we can talk about here. But it is a wonderful idea that we'll grow into one day. Mm -hmm. Although, math Joel, I'd love to have you back on the show. Right now. Love to have you back on the show sometime to talk about that particularly because there are those, for example, Joe Kane, who was on the show a week or two ago, uh, said uh, that he didn't think BT 2020 was actually something to aim for or to strive for, that there were problems with it. it makes a great container, but to actually try and get there, uh, he has a, a little problem with it. We'll talk about that another time. Uh, for now, let's continue to look at the calibration results real quick just to make sure we got everything here. Uh, this is the, uh, I guess, the SDR set saturation sweeps. I'm not, I think that's what that is. Um, and is there another page? I mention, as little as oh, two please. years ago, I, I wouldn't have shown saturation sweeps on consumer televisions publicly, period. Oh, wow. Just, they were problematic, and the last 24 months have been fantastic. You go back a few years, you'll see saturation sweeps that are just, you know, terrible per product, and this is where the chipset manufacturers and consumer TVs have made huge strides in recent past, mm. so it's great. Great mm -hmm. to see these. Good deal. Uh, this is just the gamma tracking for SDR again, and uh, looks very good, except a little bit at the high end, but nothing, nothing terrible. Uh, moving on to, let's try the Sony A1E, uh, which is uh, the other OLED, another OLED that was there, and we'll just take a quick look through that. Here are the SDR saturation sweeps; they look quite good. Moving on. Um, had a little bit of deficiency in green at the top end. The, the grayscale had a little bit more error in it, it looked like. Moving on. Uh, this grayscale looked really good. Moving on. Uh, <coughs> saturation sweeps again. Joel, as you said, you know, th these are all looking really good. I think we can... Uh, Josh, if you can keep keep moving along, I'll ask Joel um, th that the the results look pretty good across the board. I'll concur, and With the colorists were very impressed. This again, this is a new thing for consumer, and it goes right down to chipset level and manufacturers' interest in making better products. So I think you shouldn't spend that much more time going through 
all of them with limited time we have. The trend was yeah, that I agree. Uh, Tyler could sit here and look up at his work and just sort of nod. And, uh, the colorist looking at it looked at the work and sort of nodded. And this is a relatively precision row of TV sets, with the exception of one low-priced TV set, which was way off, but that didn't have the controls to make it correct. So hopefully next oh, year... Yeah. Really low that's priced. Yeah. Really low price. In fact, in fact yeah. let's take a quick look at that one while we're, while we're talking about it. That's oh, the Westinghouse. Yeah. As a point of reference, that would be great. Yes. And that point of let's reference would have been kind of normal not too many years ago. Mm. What you're looking at is a wonderful progress. So all the TVs except the Westinghouse uh, looked... Very similar in their in their calibration. Here we see uh, there's a little bit of uh, there's a little too much red, a little too little blue. The white points a little off. Move on to the next one. Um, holy smokes, that gamma is not looking very good at all. <laughs> and that was typical. And this is not after calibration. Ago, there were no calibration controls for gamma. Couldn't help ah, it. Couldn't in this it. TV, right? But Mark. Mark, you said that this set was way inexpensive, way less than the rest of them, right? Sure, I believe it's a thousand bucks or under a thousand bucks if it's on sale. I think sale it's or well under a like thousand, but I will say I'm getting reports from the field on three and four hundred dollar TV sets. They calibrate well. In fact, uh, Matt Murray bought some inexpensive ones for training and called me up, you know, chuckling that you know four hundred dollar TV came in bad and dialed in beautifully. Yeah, I had that same experience with the with the six hundred dollar TV. 55 inch uh, TCL was really, TCL. really good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are yeah. wonderful times so, for calibrators. We can make reasonably priced things look really good. I mean, you may not get the intense blacks of the best sets and the you know, niche you're looking for for the best in HDR, but you're looking at, you know, one quarter or one fifth the price. And you're still getting a nice picture. Yeah. But not this TV. Yeah. Um, K, K. Lou in the chat room is asking a question. When calibrating a TV, is it all done through the standard menu, or is it necessary to go into a secret menu, or what we all often call the service menu? Well, I can comment on that. I mean, many times you may not like the picture on the TV when you went into service mode, but you had a picture on the TV when you went into service mode. So we do not advocate anybody going into service modes on any modern TVs. Uh, one of the great relationships and we've had with virtually every manufacturer is getting the old service controls out of service, put them in yep. the consumer, and one of our top calibrators in Florida just turned two TVs into bricks in the last couple of months by going into service. <laughs> it used to be a nice little change. So, you know, we've moved them out into the consumer side. If you're going into service mode on your own TV, that's fine. But none of our calibrators are ever advised to do that. Stay out of there. You don't belong there. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree. And I've seen that, that trend as well as a reviewer. Uh, over the years, it used to be you had to get into a service mode to do any real calibration. Now you really don't. Uh, well, you Matt still Murray's need... Company, Matt's company used to provide a library. We used to feed them for distribution of service modes. It was normal. And in a generation before that, you used to take the back off the TV and you turn screws. So, we, <laughs> we, Yeah, we, right. We little had, trim pots with a tiny little screwdriver. We've all done it. You take I, a stress test. You put your fingers inside the TV set. So, you know, uh, we've now come to the <laughs> modern era where virtually all the TVs have controls accessible to consumers. It's easy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Joel, what were the what were the judging criteria specifically? I mean, you said there were three three sort of overall categories: um, studio lighting or home theater, dark room, bright room, and streaming. But within those, I assume people were looking at contrast, color. Well, let me actually color. give you the matrix that we talked to a number of people about and finalized on. Out of a hundred point mm. scale. The judges were permitted to give up to 40 points for dynamic range, which we still consider the single most important parameter of electronic imaging. So up to 40 there was possible. For color saturation, up to 20 points. For color accuracy, nicknamed colorimetry, up to 20 points. So the sum total for all color parameters equal dynamic range. And the final 20% mm -hmm. motion artifacts and resolution. And mm. looking at the content creation folks who grew up on CRTs and plasma, all the current products have motion artifacts. All the things that make a picture, display, and hold it are more difficult for colorists to live with than what they were raised with. So they all have mm -hmm. some difficulties with current sets and fast motion. 
So nothing is perfect, and because we'll still say there's no perfect TV. The common question no. I get, you know, anytime at a show or a meeting is, what's your favorite TV? My normal answer is, uh, what's your favorite screwdriver? I mean, uh, tell me about, <laughs> if you tell me about the room you're in, the content you're watching, the angle that you're viewing from, the light control in the room, and where you sit, I can start to give you a recommendation. But you can't just rattle off the perfect TV. It doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Yep, I totally agree. Or just go um, buy a v EVM and sit three feet away from it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, spend thirty thousand dollars on a thirty-inch TV. Sit three feet away from it. You're fine. You're good. Well, that's that's what the guys uh, in configuration do. They do it all day, every day. They're spoiled. Yeah, they are. It's true. Uh, Mark, uh, give us uh, some just some of your impressions of the TVs as you were looking at them as an observer, not as a judge. Uh, how did you how did you find them overall? Uh, what were your some of your impressions about just looking at content on these TVs? Well, I'll tell you, it's, uh, as Joel just said, it's circumstantial. So in that particular circumstance where we had a very wide and shallow room and where the audience chairs made it so that when you stand, stood up for critical viewing, you, you had to be close to the TVs, which is a good thing. But uh, let's just say the LCDs uh, were continuously off access to, to almost everybody. And, and, and so it reinforced in your mind the fact that, that OLEDs have much better off uh, access viewing. And uh, so that's one thing I noticed, that, that really you could only appreciate the, the LCDs at all by being uh, head on to them. Uh, the, the OLEDs, you could, uh, you could see their, you know, that they're accurate pretty much anywhere you stood. And that was you know, amplified by, by the, the shape of the room. Uh, so my impression was that the, the OLED mastering display, which, which really is the reference, I mean, that certainly had the most beautiful image. Uh, it, it, it allowed you to understand that the, that the two competing OLEDs uh, were, were getting very close uh, most of the time, uh, were either overshooting or, or undershooting, uh, depending on the scene, in, in various different ways. And, and so my impression overall was that uh, it was a seesaw and and pretty much a, a tie uh you know as far as between uh, between I, the two oleds you mean yeah yeah as, as i mean it, you really got to be nitpicking to you know to, to to be calling stuff and, and i understand that's why again you know the, the pros came in uh so that they could uh, do that really crucial viewing uh beyond that uh yeah, that, that's that's what I would say. I I don't mean to be critical, but uh, the the low tables and the fact that you had to kind of shuffle around the room made life pretty difficult for the LCDs, uh, and especially because a lot of viewing. I mean, they did have the bright room comparisons, but we we know that the LCDs don't do as well in, in dark rooms either. Uh, so many issues for them, uh, and it, and it really did become a, a shootout between the the two OLEDs. Uh, I mean, that was clear from. Pretty much the first minute anybody walked in, they, they knew that that's what the competition was going to be about, uh, mm. because the goal here is to match that mastering display. And uh, yeah, anybody which is an eyes, OLED, yeah, which is an OLED, and anybody with eyes can see, that, yeah, that the two OLEDs there were were, were you know, under any of the conditions that they were presenting were, were doing that, uh, you know, more reliably, for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Scott, Matt, if I can mention one thing about the uh, oh, bright sorry? room mode, if I take mm -hmm. a moment, if I can mention one thing. Please. Uh, Please. I went to the bright room mode, turned on the lights, and I declared the winner instantly. The winner in the bright room mode was HDR. <laughs> None of and the TVs, but HDR. The, uh, they all performed dramatically better. And, you know, uh, Robert Zahn being a retailer there... He's dealing with real life people all day, every day, and we have more bad rooms for video than good rooms. The best tool we've had for bad rooms has been HDR, and we had one reviewer that you and I both know well who was sort of complaining to me. He only got 900 nits out of his TVs reviewing. He wants 1,200. I had to remind him that we used to get excited about 150. Yeah, so right. Nine, Okay, so this was fantastic, and getting the public involved just to see their faces when Matt pressed a button and enabled HDR and every TV just basically took off and went bright and became watchable as opposed to unwatchable, this is a big deal, and uh, at this coming CEDIA, I'm going to be teaching a course on front projection in media rooms with HDR. 
which yeah. makes them functional in rooms we couldn't use yeah. before. So Mark was saying as before, this is not a small incremental improvement. It's a combination of three or four major things between the HDR and a wide gamut, better bit depth, more resolution. It, it's a plan from 2012 that's starting to come to fruition. So throwing yeah. that in front of the judges, even into bright rooms, and yes, Mark's right. The LCDs, you do have to be in a narrow cone, both up and down and left and right to appreciate them. But that's the nature of the beast. But, you know, down here in it's, Florida, where I live, we need them in some of the brightest rooms because that's the only thing that will compete with the 20-foot high windows we've got in some of these luxury homes. <laughs> yeah, once yes, you get to indeed. that, it's a different environment. Uh, how, much, how good the anti-reflective coating of the screen becomes important when you've got a bright room with white walls and, and furniture and, and all that. Uh, so, yeah, your own reflection in the screen is the worst image quality artifact that, that I know <laughs> of. I mean, it's the last thing you want to see. So, and, and, and that's not a problem in a dark room, but in a bright room it is. So, yeah, just a completely different uh, set of qualities uh, come into play, and yeah. I agree. HDR is just uh, spectacular once, uh, yeah, the, the Planet Earth footage... Uh, that fills the full screen uh, and is full of, you know, really intense color. Uh, yeah, I, that, that's, that's like I'm your summer you beach house. Coding. I serve on the Infocom Contrast Committee, and we've been testing quite a few direct views for signs and chat rooms and telecommunications. The coatings are a, a science to themselves, and they're getting better as well. Now you talk about mm -hmm. cameras and, and lenses and what you pay for. And, you know, the coating is uh, really important in getting that high contrast out of the lens. And you know how much you pay for a lens that has good coating on it. And then I was thinking, my goodness. So, of course, you must pay more also on a, on a big TV to get a good coating on that big piece of glass, right? I mean, Especially if you're not putting yeah, in a seriously. perfect room. And most of my clients don't have perfect rooms. Kevin Miller at the recent uh, Samsung QLED HDR10 Summit uh, <clears throat> summarized some of the uh, results of a survey done about consumer viewing habits, and I think uh, it was like a single digits of percentage of people watching in a dark room, the vast majority watching in bright rooms with, with some light, at least some light, if not a lot of light. Uh, so uh, the points you're making here are very well taken and really important. To, uh, also, to Scott, one of the things that's hard to see in that study, uh, the people who watch in the darkened rooms also by the most expensive and the largest TV sets. So it's an interesting mm -hmm. study. That small percentage yeah, yeah, yeah. is the high end. And oh, uh, it, most yeah. people Isn't get calibrated like they watch the think, environment. It's not the average viewer. Yeah. And I believe 5% of uh, TV buyers are responsible for about 50% of profits. Uh, if you just like draw a line at about 1500 bucks and look at it, uh, the money that's driving research and development and, and profits in the TV industry is coming from those TVs and that small group of people that care. Yeah, We've had that yeah. in every industry. Yeah. The early adopters are basically patrons of the art. They're buying tomorrow's technology today and they know it. And they're enjoying it for years before the average person gets it, but they're paying a premium for it. And that's where the high end has to play. We're developing technologies on the very best TVs that trickle I've, on down. I've always applauded early adopters for exactly that reason. They're the ones that are really uh, funding, <laughs> if you will, uh, the development of, of the TVs. Matt, before we run out of time, I wanted to, to get back to you a little bit. As one of the judges, uh, what were some of your impressions overall of looking at all these TVs? Um, so I think... Um um, Mark made a great point. Uh, they, you know, from from a walking into the room, um, off off to uh, where the main entrance was, you see the OLED displays, and you can see off axis. You can see uh, what look like accurate colors from off axis, and you can see the LCD TV struggling with the off axis. Um, from a judge's perspective, um, and you know, the, the we we intentionally didn't all confer with each other, um, so we kind of you know tried oh, to that's be good. as, yeah, you know, yeah, just just kind of be as as uh, independent um, as possible. Um, but you know, I have to imagine, and and me as a as a human being, I had to take you know cautiously kind of make sure that uh, my evaluations were basically kind of. Uh, you know, based on a, a good viewing point in the room when I'm looking at the LCDs. So um, that, that I will, you know, I take that as really good feedback as to, you know, positioning these things and how maybe they should look in the future because the, you know, we had the Z9D in there. 
the Samsung Q series, uh, QLED, and those you know those are phenomenal displays. Um, you do have to be on access, but I will also say this: it lends kind of credibility to the process of having um, you know people who deal with TVs regularly and see this stuff in the real world judging these for the final vote because um, you know the the off access thing. I don't think a lot of um, end user type group would be able to get over in that setting you know that would almost be a a an, an, an instant no-go for most you know but uh mm. the fact that there was on, on the other hand to judge it on the other hand just to that point uh the the study that kevin miller cited at the samsung event a couple weeks ago uh said that i was found this a little surprising that the vast majority of viewers who responded said yeah they watch pretty much on axis they, there isn't a lot of off-axis viewing, which I, well, I and, was kind of surprised I, at. I, I think I could, I could agree with that study because um, I think in your home setting you are on access. You know, you're you're putting your couch somewhere in front of the TV. Um, I think mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the the bigger point from a consumer walking into the TV shootout is uh, they come in from the side and all the LCDs are are uh, basically looking washed out because you're looking at them from the side. So I think that just, it elevated that um, a little bit, but that's why I think it was good that we had the, uh, you know, the professionals who could look at these things and say, okay, you know, which ones are looking like the, uh, the broadcast monitor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Scott, one of the things we requested uh, for following years, if we're going to continue doing this with professionals, is a lot bigger room, a lot deeper room, and the ability to angle the TVs which would make mm, it much easier to judge if we got a bunch of them pointed at the eight to 10 judges. But yeah, we just need, right. a, lot and, you know, the, we need the, a lot more real the estate. Other, the other thing I'll say too, and you know, let's, let's just be honest with this, you know, the OLED technology in ways is a superior technology. So it's a very difficult, it's very difficult from a judge's standpoint, um, knowing things about these things, you're, you know, you're judging color, you're judging accuracy, you're judging all of these things. Um, you know, and I think I think the I think the winner would have probably been the winner, um, no matter who was voting. I think in this circumstance this year. Mm. And so, in the last few minutes we have, let's talk about that. Um, unlike years past, where all the TVs were were basically rated one one through whatever number, uh, they didn't do that this year. All they did was announce the winner in each of those three categories. Dark room, bright room, streaming, and um, Joel, tell us uh, who won. Well, LG actually won all three categories, and it was intriguing. LG E7 uh, OLED. And last year, the Sony had cleanly won the bright room category. It was intriguing that if, the different coatings and more light output, because the OLEDs in mass are dramatically brighter than they were two years ago, brighter than last year so uh it but they're still not nearly as bright as as lcds and uh audience not voting in front of them and in a bright room it's what we use in bright rooms it's just that the well, audience it, it, for a bright tv the audience uh, didn't vote against uh, uh wasn't explicitly voting against a mastering monitor so perhaps a different result right. because those things on the other hand you know lg won last year and the year before i think the LG OLED. Well, overall. Yeah, yeah, overall. Overall, so yeah, but there was only one category to... overall. Yeah, this was, this was yes. the first year where they split it out. Um, so the LG E7. Different, different people do different things with TVs, so, and streaming is now yeah. such a huge part of our market that we couldn't ignore it this year. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. But, uh, uh, Matt, didn't, uh, didn't the Sony and the LG, the Sony OLED, I mean, uh, they were awfully close uh, in the final analysis, weren't they? They were very, very, very close. And, and that's actually uh, the way that the scores were calculated, I thought was very good because it lended to um, a close competition that way. I mean, it was, you know, there was, oh, I think it was uh, 500 points total per category um, that you could possibly get. And, I mean, they were extremely, extremely close. So that's, you know, that's why they decided, uh, Joel can expand on it. He was part of that, that part of it more, but they did decide to do 
um, an honorable mention for the Sony because it was just, you know, if, in some ways it was, you know, too close to call. Mm. Well, Kevin and myself, Joel, you wanna... well, I could say Kevin and I decided, you know, we weren't voting, we weren't judging, we were doing calibration, supervision, and we were pointing to different content, and we'd let the judges do what they want to do. We didn't even want to see scores, but uh, we were asked to just take a look at the percent differences, and the percent difference was minuscule. And I think Mark mentioned it, the toss-up between the two was a very tough thing. I was very happy not to be a judge on those two. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, tough. But I will say one it, thing. One of the judges looked at the TV, asked us to pause something, and said, this scene looks brighter. Now, I took out a brand new Minolta LS150. It's the most accurate luminance meter in the market. We use it for research at Infocom. And we took the meter and pointed to the exact spot on the screen that he saw a difference in. And it was 5% different in luminance. And he picked it up from 20 feet away and got up and confirmed it. So these guys living in front of BVMs, their eyes are not quite like the average person's eyes. We consider anything under 10% invisible. He saw half that and walked up and confirmed it. And, you know, dynamic range still being the most important part of things. Um, he found that to be more dynamic and voted accordingly by a small amount. Mm -hmm. So I like um, the matrix. We're going to stick with the matrix, adding a streaming device category I think is key getting a better room I think is key and getting more judges is key and uh, mm -hmm. I talked to Robert Zahn a couple of days ago and his first thing he said is when he used to run it he would do everything he could to curve the display into an arc and I have to agree with him uh, that was mm -hmm. better than what we did at the shootout and we just didn't have the physical room New York real estate is not exactly yeah. free and easy but if we had a ballroom yeah. we could do quite a bit more with the angles of the L CDs, or maybe pipe and drape, because if you're looking at an LCD from a 70 or 80 degree angle off axis, that's not what it's for. It's not what it does. No, no. And that's not how people yeah, use yeah. it. Now, a game singer in the chat room is making a good point. Can you mention that both the LG and the Sony OLED TVs use the same panel? That any difference that there might be is probably in the electronics. Um, He's 100 which right, that's, half, that's, half, that's half the TV. The raw yeah, glass. Exactly. <laughs> It. You know, exactly. The drive electronics, the processing, the color management, all that is half the TV. Mm -hmm. uh, one last quite, question. Quite, uh, quite different their approach. In fact, Mark, you looked at the two. As much as you might have trouble judging, was it easy to see differences on the two? Yes. Sure. It was. It was a constant back and forth uh, of difference. You know, with the yeah. with the with the mastering monitor serving as a reference. Totally. Yeah, they were always so. So the two were the two were were kind of just. Chasing each other, yeah. one was a little yeah, better here, the other was a little better there, and back and forth. One scene and, and one's huh? a little closer to the mastering reference. Yeah, the other scene, you know, either undershooting or overshooting, just and, and really by small percentages, like they said, just uh, mm -hmm. stuff that 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 ultimately you have to be some a, a video file in this controlled setting, thinking about it, you know, uh, with that reference to. But yeah, if you put them side by side, they they look different from each other. If that's what you're asking, yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah. yeah, scene by scene, mm -hmm. you see little subtle differences. Probably and there, are two, based. there are two more OLEDs using the same panel in Europe. You've got it from Ruva and you've got it from Panasonic. Also quick, different. Quick comment. Yeah. quick comment. Some people were surprised that Sony didn't win the streaming category because Sony's processing uh, works on uh, posterization you know, type banding, uh, whereas LG... Uh, I, I was just curious about the judges. You know, some some people had hypothesized that the LG won that because it was actually more faithful to the source in the sense that the streaming, you know, if the streaming media had problems, you know, with with banding uh, posterization, I mean, you know, that that it was reflected exactly the way it was on on, on the uh, master monitor, where Sony was actually processing it uh, a little bit. I was just wondering if uh, maybe Matt could speak to that at all. What was your take on on why the streaming? prize basically went to the LG when they were that close and what parameter led to that decision? I think what people were looking for, the judges, um, and, you know, I can only really speak for myself totally, but was, um, you know, color artifacts are one thing, motion artifacts um, were, those were the ones that um, you really kind of could, could pick out more. Um, it's, it, it, it was very, very tough between the LG and the Sony, especially when you're Looking at um, the streaming content, I think we put up the show. Uh, um, it was Meridian, called Meridian. Meridian. So, Meridian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so 
so when we put that show up, um, and, and you know, this this is this is basically why I made the decision I made during the, during some dark scenes. There seemed to be a lot of blooming um, during parts where it definitely wasn't supposed to be there. And I think what what you said is probably pretty close to to right on. Is is uh, because something is being added when it shouldn't be there is probably what some people saw blooming on a mm. OLED uh, would have to be. Well, added. yeah, right. Mm. Uh, Matt, one last question: uh, How? The, the two OLEDs, I think we can all agree, were very, very close to, to being equally good. How far, the, how big was the gap then to the next, the best LCD? Um, I, the, I, I have to say that was pretty close. I mean, not, not uh, you know, uh, uh, a finite hair close to um, mm -hmm. the two OLEDs, but uh, the, the, you know, the, especially the, the Z9, you know, that was that's a very compelling display uh, because it does it does have uh, brighter highlights and and kind of uh, specular things like that. But um, you know, I think the dynamic range um, it is better on OLED still, even though the uh, the LCDs can deliver more brightness. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's I think you know an important thing to kind of consider. Okay, cool. Well, uh, listen, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, let me start with you, Joel. Uh, ImagingScience.com is the website. And uh, as the master of ceremonies and, and head honcho of this uh, event, I think you did a fantastic job. And I look forward to next year. Thank you so much for being here. Also, tell you, I learned a lot doing it. And talking to the people in content creation, looking what they think should happen on TV sets, we all learned a lot. So this is uh, yeah. an interesting turn of events. And again, I've got to thank Rob Azan for permitting us to administer his baby and people at CE Week for giving us the real estate, setting things up. And we had a lot of people helping. So the amount of time we had to set up was small. The amount of people who helped was large. I couldn't begin to thank all the people here, but they know who they are. We appreciate their efforts. And we all learned. It was interesting. And thanks for giving us Very. the opportunity to talk about it with your audience. You bet. You bet. My pleasure. Uh, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, your uh, website, avproconnect.com. So that's where people can find out about you. Uh, thanks so much for being here and for being one of the judges. No, my pleasure. Thank you for uh, having us here today. Um, definitely, uh, definitely anytime you um, have questions about HDR connectivity, reach out. I'm happy. I'm always happy to go on site and help make that stuff work. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll get you back on the show sometime. We'll focus on that on that topic. That sounds like a great idea. Thank you. And uh, finally, Mark Henninger, uh, my cohort and friend at avsforum.com. Uh, thanks so much for your insight here as well. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. And uh, thanks, Joel. Thanks, Matt. That was a great shootout. And uh, appreciate being able to see all those TVs uh, brought up to that, you know, tip top level. And yeah, mm -hmm. so really enjoyed so, it. Yeah, very good. Uh, you can always find me, of course, at avsforum.com as well. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at avsforum, where Mark uh, is also found on Twitter. Uh, you can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at uh, twit.tv slash htg. And on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, Mark Henninger will return, and uh, he and I are going to answer chat room questions. So be sure to get your questions ready. I'm especially looking for um, beginner or newbie questions uh, because I've gotten a lot of requests for that over the, over the years of uh, Home Theater Geeks, and uh, we certainly would like to help those of you who feel a little overwhelmed with all of this stuff uh, to become less overwhelmed. So... Uh, regardless of what your questions might be, bring them along next week, uh, post them in the chat room, and we will be very happy to discuss them. Uh, so, uh, and I do hope you'll join us for that. Until then, geek out. <laughs> <laughs>